So yesterday, the LHC uh, made an announcement that they reached a energy record in their uh, run three of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, and they have reached a um, maximum energy of 13.6 uh, trillion electron volts. So this is a very interesting uh, development, and it may lead to new physics uh, being discovered at CERN. So this energy is um, uh, being made possible by uh, the collimation and focusing of proton beams, uh, high energy proton beams that are accelerated uh, at the CERN uh, Large Hadron Collider. And each beam has an energy of uh, 6.8 uh, um, tera electron volts or trillion electron volts, and they're collided in uh, collisions, head on collisions. Uh, and this is actually a big achievement uh, uh, because it's the first time that energies like this are able to be produced uh, in a controlled uh, situation. Now, in the atmosphere, uh, in a previous video on this channel, I showcased a talk that I gave back in 2011. Uh, high energy cosmic rays can achieve much greater energies uh, than this in the atmosphere, but of course, we don't have flying uh, particle detectors in the atmosphere that are able to achieve the sensitivity of the collisions, and also we don't always know where these collisions take place. And that, in fact, is the key uh, challenge of this uh, research, one of the key challenges in how do you actually collide uh, protons, which are very small, moving at very high speeds uh, into each other in a known location uh, on the order of nanometers uh, or, or less even. And this is uh, what I want to talk about actually today. So I have a nice uh, website here. This is uh, LHC uh, Machine Outreach, and this actually is a very short page, but actually goes over uh, some of the um, key uh, points about this uh, challenge. So uh, the beams uh, are made of protons, and you may think by the animation that I just showed you that the beams are very, you know, visible, very uh, obvious, but they move more like a cloud or more like a fluid uh, than like actual uh, solid billiard balls. So. Uh, the um, website here showcases um, the numbers, and um, the numbers are obviously quite large, but the main point to get across is, is that uh, the collision rate is determined by the luminosity of the beam, which is, uh, in each case, uh, 6.8 or roughly 7 tera electron volts, and multiplied by a thing called a cross-section. And the cross-section is basically area, and it's measured in a unit called Barnes. And uh, this unit Barnes uh, is um, roughly 100 uh, femtometers, or uh, um, 10 by uh, 10 to the power of minus 28 meters uh, squared, or uh, 100 femto femtometers uh, squared. So it's a very small amount, and it actually comes from the phrase. Uh, if I look up on the Wikipedia article for Barn, uh, Barn. Uh, unit. unit. Uh, it actually goes into detail about uh, where the name came from. Uh, it came, comes from uh, a phrase from the United States. Uh, apparently, if you're a person who has very bad aim, uh, you sa they say uh, you couldn't hit the sod broad side of a barn. And uh, so it basically arose from a uh, the particle uh, early particle physics research in which they were um, trying to um, hit really large to them large uh, objects and it's interesting that a barn is roughly the cross-sectional area of a uranium nucleus uh, so um, it's roughly of that size or as i said 100 femtometers squared or 10 to 10 uh, 28 meters squared but basically it's just area cross-sectional area uh, that's the main uh, point to get across. Uh, so going back to the website, um, the website actually has here the details. Now, the amount of protons is in the order of uh, 100,000 um, million protons uh, in a area of 64 microns. 
about the width of a human hair. And I have another animation that shows uh, roughly what this um, means in terms of the scale involved. So if I just jump forward a little bit, it's roughly the size of Spain uh, in the one euro coin. So uh, the beam is actually narrowed to the point at which it's able to pass through uh, Spain on the one euro coin. So it's a very small uh, area. Uh, so the area is very small. However, the number of collisions that are of interest is uh, very small as well. So even in this small area where you have an interaction point, the number of collisions that occur uh, particle collisions of protons uh, that are of interest are very small, roughly only 20 uh, collisions uh, per crossing at nominal beam currents. So the event rate is quite small because the cross-sectional area is, is quite small. And also, uh, if you remember from physics, there are different types of collisions, inelastic, elastic collisions, and diffractive, basically scattering type collisions. And these all occur uh, at the collision point, at the interaction point. However, the cross section from the elastic scattering uh, essentially is not of interest. Uh, it's of some interest, but it's not of main interest in the um, generation of new types of particles, uh, whereby we have 6.8 colliding with uh, 6.8 uh, beams. So if I draw a picture, you can imagine the beams, I'll draw them in red, uh, colliding collide like this. And I'll draw them as arrows, as we'll see. It makes more sense to draw them as arrows because we can determine them as vectors as well. So we have a beam coming in this direction. And another beam coming in this direction. They're of the same scale. And we'll say one has uh, yeah, 6.8 TeV, and the other has also the same amount of energy 6.8 TeV. And they collide, but the collisions could be elastic or inelastic. The elastic collisions will obviously, uh, as the name suggests, lead to collisions in which the particles, the protons are bouncing off one another in opposite directions at different angles. And these may actually take, if they go directly elastically at, no, uh, at the same angle of incidence, then they won't pass through the detectors in the detector apparatus. So the LHC has different detectors, LHC, B, uh, ALICE, and so on. ALICE is the biggest one, and LHC, B is uh, another large detector all around the um, perimeter, the circumference of the accelerator. And these are lined with detectors. So I'll draw the detectors maybe in yellow. And you can imagine The detector up here and another detector down here. Each of these detectors will have to uh, have a particle cross them in order to register. But if the collisions are perfectly elastic, that means no particle will cross the detector. And so it'll be registered, therefore, as a null event. However, if we have inelastic collisions, then the particles will join together, fuse together. They will disintegrate, of course, because they're of such high energy. The quarks and gluons and so on will fuse or uh, disintegrate and or form new particles by uh, transfer of energy into new matter. And this will then create particles that will shower from a center in an interaction point, the interaction point, as we said, that's in a area of a couple of hundred barns. And at the interaction point, then we will get new particles that will fly out and enter 
And this is why the inelastic scattering that occurs is of interest to the um, scientists performing these experiments. Now, the, the vectors uh, that the particles represent, that the arrows here represent, are uh, four vectors, so they would be something like uh, the momentum four vector would be the equal to the um, the energy uh, and the momentum in the uh, x coordinate multiplied by c, the momentum in the y coordinate multiplied by c. C is the speed of light and the momentum in the CE coordinate multiplied by C. So that's the what we call a four vector for the system. And we could have P1 as our momentum for beam one and so that's P1 and of course we will write our momentum for P2 is equal to the same thing E meant to be a seed here but you get the idea so p2 is this beam and all we have to concern ourselves with is the energy so the energies add up together when the beam collides and so it's simply 6.8 teb plus 6.8 te V, and that's why the total beam energy is this. So the two energies add up. They're, even though they're moving in opposite directions, they will add up because it is a, a way in which we'll add vec we add vectors, add the vector energy together, and it's 13.6 TeV in total. And so this energy range is uh, interesting because we begin to approach energy ranges in which I have here in a diagram that I used in a, another video in which uh, we approach new, per, perhaps uh, new physics. So um, there are theories of supersymmetry which have been um, proposed for um, hierarchy of masses because there are problems with um, current definitions of why there should be uh, different masses of particles. Why, are, why is the top quark, for example, so heavy um, relative to the um, other quarks in, in the family of, uh, of quarks? And uh, one solution to this is supersymmetry. There's also the uh, problem of dark matter in the universe uh, as determined by the rotation, rotation of galaxies and, uh, and so on. And this is um, one problem which they want to use the higher energies of particle collisions to try and solve. Uh, there are proposed particles, uh, axions, um, uh, dark photons, uh, gravity photons, and so on, uh, some of which uh, people like Lisa Randall have talked about uh, exist in, the kind of, in kind of warped geometry of space and time. And these are perhaps, uh, again, that's all theoretical, uh, perhaps accessible by the energies uh, being explored uh, at these higher energies. And uh, of course, we can't mention um, the LHC without mentioning, of course, its uh, most famous particle, uh, as popularized by um, the media, the Higgs boson. And funnily enough, uh, the 13.6 uh, TeV um, achievement was announced uh, yesterday, which is a day after uh, July 4th, um, which 
July 4th, 2022, was actually the 10 year anniversary of the Higgs boson discovery. Um, and this was something that I was witness to back in 2012. And I actually uploaded the video here back in on the day, July 4th, uh, 2012. So 10 years ago. I'm rather now, surprised it happened ago, in my lifetime. I, I, I certainly had no idea. Uh, that this it would, discovery was, uh, would happen in of course, very important. Um, of course, I'm very happy uh, by, uh, on that. The result now is really uh, Carl Hagen and others. Well, this is uh, a culmination of a search which has been uh, going on for uh, some time theory, now. Perhaps of, it of is uh, was actually proposed by going uh, to be an achievement, teams, I trust, um, which results Higgs in is the one who got the name for it, and the Higgs boson is. If uh, there's good videos of this by. Um, uh, Stanford University by Professor uh, Leonard Suskind, uh, who actually discusses um, a lot of the factual um, facts about the um, Higgs boson. But essentially, one of the um, key um, theor uh, theoretical underpinnings of it is uh, the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking, that in fact, um, the acquisition of mass of particles um, of a particle such as, let's say, a particle, um, particle here, uh, the acquisition of mass um, is not entirely uh, obvious how particles uh, acquire mass. And the Higgs theory um, suggests that uh, instead of particles existing in a, a minima energy space or a um, or a maxima, they exist in a non-zero uh, energy space. So this is my crappy attempt at drawing a Mexican hat potential. And this function essentially determines uh, the mass or energy rest state mass of the particle. And it can be non-zero essentially. It can, instead of existing in a ground state such as a well a quantum well where you would have uh, basically a saddle type function and the particle existing simply at the bottom of the well at the glo uh, global minima it would exist in a local minima it would roll down this energy surface and would occupy a state which is non-zero. And this non-zero state is a field, and it's a field which permeates the universe, which is called uh, the Higgs field. And these Higgs bosons exist in a kind of a condensate in this Higgs field, and they're of non-zero mass, essentially, by the existence of this Higgs field. So that's a kind of a maybe not not so concise uh, uh, summation of um, the Higgs uh, mechanism, if you like. But um, there are better videos, uh, better explanations of it than me. Um, it requires quite a lot of explanation, actually, to you have to go into um, details about uh, the electroweak uh, Lagrangian and how um, spontaneous symmetry breaking occurs. Uh, between the forces of the electroweak uh, interaction. But that in a nutshell is the Higgs mechanism. So yes, it is 10 years after uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson, which was predicted by uh, several people, uh, of what, the most prominent of which was of course, Peter Higgs at the University of Edinburgh. So that's uh, mainly all I want to talk about with the announcement of 13.6, uh, apart from the fact that it is an interesting um, development that perhaps new physics will emerge. Um, another uh, kind of glaring elephant in the room is uh, the country I live in, Ireland, uh, funnily enough, um, is, you know, kind of embarrassingly, the only, one of the only member states, not a, even a member of CERN, uh, where this is taking place, uh, even though Ireland has actually punched well above its weight in terms of the contributions of um, of uh, particle physics research in general, 
Uh, but uh, whenever announcements like this happen, uh, it usually kicks up uh, kind of an argument that leads to nowhere uh, about why the country Ireland is not a member of CERN, uh, even though um, uh, you can see here from even from 2014, uh, two years after the Higgs boson was discovered, uh, Institute of Physics in Ireland wrote a uh, kind of a memorandum, I suppose, uh, of um, uh, you know case for Irish membership of CERN. And one of the interesting um, developments, contributions that Ireland has made, among other things, um, it has actually quite an active particle physics community, uh, mostly theorists, but a few experimentalists. But actually, Ireland has actually made detectors uh, for LHCb, uh, I believe. Um, so look at the Tyndall Institute in Cork, um, County Cork uh, in Ireland. Uh, they had made silicon um uh, detectors, particle detectors, essentially for the LHCb, uh, which was um, which is being explored for um, uh, particle decays uh, of the weak interaction, among other things. Uh, some of which, you know, research was relevant for the uh, classification and um, you know discovery of the properties of the Higgs boson, uh, among other things, other bosons as well, W and Z, Z bosons. Um, but uh, yeah, the question of why Ireland is not a member of CERN is something that always uh, kicks up um, when you know when events like this happen, and it is an open question uh, because um, institutes like Tyndall uh, in Cork um, have made not only um, detectors for um, inside the, uh, the these uh, accelerator systems. But they've also made radiation detectors for CERN uh, scientists uh, to use. Uh, there was this um, uh, chip, I think, chip-based um, radiation detector called Ra RADFET, which was made uh, by a Tyndall Institute uh, scientist. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's quite interesting that Ireland, um, uh, even though it's contributed a lot to particle physics research over the, over the years, um, is not a member of CERN and uh, this is again often discussed by the media the mainstream media here um, talking about that even a membership would basically be only a rounding error uh, like one million associate membership and uh, like again you even have like countries like you know Pakistan and, and India uh, they're not even in the European Union that are members but somehow Ireland is not able to uh, put forward you know a million euro to be a member even though it's a member of um, ESA, European Space Agency, and um, the ITER, International Thermonuclear Fusion Project. Um, but then there is also an argument to be made that um, uh, even without being a membership of, of CERN, Ireland is able to really um, get some key contracts with regards to uh, development of sensors uh, for use in CERN detectors, but whether or not that will continue, and um, uh, you know, CERN isn't really going anywhere. It seems to be um, a, a place that's going to be an operation for. It's been an operation for over fifty years now. It's not not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Uh, but whether or not that continues, uh, it allows Ireland to, um, you know, have contracts with making um, detectors like uh, the. Let me look it up. Radfet. Uh, detector Radfet miniature detector that was it yeah this uh, detector was made by a scientist working at Tyndall um, yeah so um, Alexander Ajaxic uh, Russell Duan and Nicola Vasovic at Tyndall National Institute. This is in County Cork in Ireland. Uh, they were making uh, detectors, and uh, apparently they had uh, were able to sell or, or make tr over three thousand of them. Um, Radfit for uh, devices, medical devices, but also for use at CERN. Uh, so, um, so yes. Uh, 3,000 radfets installed in LHC ring at CERN. So um, that's quite a key contribution made by by, an, by scientists working in Ireland. So again, it raises the question, why isn't Ireland a member of CERN? 
And it's a question that I asked even back in 2012 when um, the Higgs boson was announced. And I was still doing, I was finishing my undergraduate at the time. And I had an interest in particle physics research. I asked uh, the question, like, why isn't Ireland um, such an outlier in, in this regard? But um, anyway, this has been a um, interesting development and the um, science involved with uh, collimation of the beam and uh, the um, ability to have a beam so narrowly focused in a uh, such a small area um, on the order of atomic nuclei um, and the detection of potential detection of new physics is something definitely to keep an eye on uh, over the next few years. Uh, these experiments um, run over over many, many years, uh, even after an initial uh, detection uh, collision event like this, uh, the, the, um, the real work is in the data analysis and the um, reconstruction effectively of these uh, particle collisions. So uh, this was an interesting thing to witness and hopefully we'll be hearing more from CERN and the LHC experiments in the near future.